So it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Professor June Wang from the uh, University of Nebraska at Lincoln. Uh, June is one of the foremost authorities on aerosol uh, retrieval from uh, remote sensing measurements, and he's visiting us at the moment in ACOM as a uh, as a uh, ASP faculty uh, faculty fellow for a few months. June got his PhD in atmospheric sciences from the University of Alabama, Huntsville, in 2005 with the support of a NASA graduate fellowship, and he went on to do a uh, postdoc at Harvard, uh, supported by NOAA. Uh, his work at Nebraska is focused on the integration of uh, satellite uh, remote sensing and chemistry transport models to study aerosol, uh, atmospheric aerosols and wildfires. And he's a science team member for a number of uh, the NASA satellite missions, including the uh, Decadal Survey GeoCape concept mission, which is where we started working together as members of the uh, science, uh, science working group. June's got a very impressive resume. He's co-authored uh, authored or co-authored more than uh, 70 papers in the peer-reviewed literature and is regularly invited as a speaker at international meetings around the world. He's a recipient of uh, the NASA New Investigator Award for 2009 and the sub subsequent NASA Group Achievement Awards. In addition to uh, his uh, um, uh, research activities in aerosol remote sensing, June takes uh, uh, teaching very seriously and he's supervised and sponsored 11 graduate students, 15 undergraduate students and four postdoctoral researchers. And in 2009 he received the Academic Star Award from uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln for taking the art of mentoring to new heights. Today he's going to be speaking to us on uh, satellite remote sensing of aerosols for air quality and climate and uh, uh, pointing out for us some of the current capabilities and uh, the next steps for. So, June, well, welcome, and uh, very much look forward to your seminar. Okay, thank you very much, uh, David, for, for that uh, nice introduction. Can you guys hear me well? Um, okay. So, uh, as David said, that, uh, um, let's see here. So, I'm visiting here, and I know that you guys just had a name change, right, called ACOM. So, actually, I find it's very hard to find a good name. So I, I have this name here called Aroma. <laughs> you guys can vote for it. Should you guys call it Aroma or should I call it ACOM? Okay. So Aroma stands for Aerosol Radiation Remote Sensing and Observation Based Modeling of Aerosols. Uh, here we have two R's. One is radiation, one is remote sensing. Okay. So anyway, why I'm here? Well, because I'm a UCAR guest and I have a privilege to use this one password here. <laughs> every day, every Monday, I need to remember those. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anyway, so what I'm going to do really today is try to, uh, you know, for the purpose, because I'm visiting here, so I want to you know, do some of the projects that my students have been doing. So hopefully, uh, we have more exchanges that students can come in, or I can invite you to go to, go to visit us, and we have some more uh, interesting projects. So. Um, so the outline of my talk is really try to uh, first part is try a brief introduction of the uh, aerosol life cycle and the importance of aerosols, and I will go on to the approach, talk about satellite measurements of aerosols and how, how we're going to integrate those together, and uh, and uh, to demonstrate this approach with a couple of results, per, per, um, focus on the uh, you know uh, air quality monitoring, including estimate of natural anthropogenic emissions and our, then also the uh, absorbing aerosols above clouds. And uh, in the end, I will give a summary and outlook. So uh, the origin of aerosols, uh, you know, the aerosols can come from primary sources, can come from secondary sources. And uh, so they have large spatial and tem uh, temporal variability. And uh, so that's something that why the aerosol effects on air quality and the climate has been so difficult, because we have to characterize this spatial and temporal variability that range from you know, a point location to, you know, continental scale. So uh, that's kind of a difficulty, a difficulty we try to tackle with. And uh, so once the aerosols are formed in the atmosphere, you know, they usually will, you know, get transported to the downwind, and they are going to interact with the clouds. And uh, through the dry deposition and wet deposition, uh, they will affect the ecosystems as well, OK? So, uh, so this one lifetime in the troposphere generally take about one week. So you have effect on the health, the visibility, weather and the climate, and also the biogeochemistry. 
So my work has been, my group work has been trying to focus on air quality and climate um, uh, in this regard. So the, this is the uh, IPCC AR5 in terms of the air radio frosting. I'm sure you have seen this a lot. So basically, this uh, air related frosting overall is negative, and, but however, large uncertainty bars, more than 100%, compared to the greenhouse gas forcing uh, uncertainty, this one is much huge, it's, it's, it's larger. So we want to narrow this down so that we can have a better prediction of the climate. And they also put this one here, in terms of different component, air are different component. So you got a sulfate air source, you have uh, that can have ammonia and, and SO2 that will form sulfate, uh, ammonium sulfate, and you also got the biomass burning air source, which is more complicated because it can uh, generate the uh, black carbon, which is a kind of a warming effect when they deposit all the snow or, or when they over clouds. But on the other hand, it also generates uh, organic carbon air source, which have a cooling effect too. So then you also get the air to cloud interactions where you really, this bar is off the chart, uncertainty is off the chart. We don't know how much effects are there. So, so it's very uh, uncertain. Um, so we generally, uh, so I'm going to be primarily talking about the uh, uh, sulfate air source and the biomass burning air source. To some extent, dust air source. I'm not going to touch anything on the air source cloud interactions in this talk. Um, regarding the, uh, the air source effect on, on, the, on the air quality, you can see that, you know, these are about 10 years, right? The air quality in, uh, category, you know, or nearly 24 hour air quality standard is 65.5. Now it's get to the 35.5. So you can see, although we have been trying to reduce our emissions, but on the other hand, we are also trying to uh, strengthen our uh, criteria for clean air. So there are key questions, for example, you know, how much pollutants are transported from, a, from other regions, and uh, how much emissions should we reduce to achieve the new standard, things like that. On the health side, you know, there will be about you know, over $150 million per year in terms of health effects because of the pollution. So actually, this is our standard for the US. If you look to the WMO rec recommendation, you will find the standard is more stringent. The you know, annual mean PM2.5 is up less than 10, OK? In the US, is about 15, OK? And 24 hour mean is 25. We are now 35.5. So you can imagine that if in the developing countries, there is no way they can meet those standards, right? So in many places, you can see that the PM can be over easily over 100, 200, 300 in many places. So, so it's, a, it's a problem. Um, so how can we monitor the EPA uh, PM2.5 as well as forecast them so that we can, we can better plan, uh, can, can help people's planning? Uh, so I lay out several challenges here. One is that the, because those are the, in the US, we have about 1,200 uh, uh, monitoring size, so it's very, it's already very good. But still, you see many places there we don't have PM2.5 uh, stations, right? So if you look, pick up the South, let's say South, uh, South Dakota, there there are very few, but you can see fires from there. So, so anyway, so they they kind of produce uh, they kind of the make the model initial condition not very sufficient to have a good forecast. Certainly, if you are running the air quality model, uh, regional air quality model, you also got a boundary conditions. So you could have got dust, let's say, from, from Asia that we need to consider them. But you know, you can get the boundary conditions from a global model, but you know, when you predict the dust from a global model, as the dust move away from the source region, that error, that model error is become larger and larger. So if you want to use a global model to, to, to nest the regional model, that where the location and the time, the dust will get into your regional model domain can have a huge error. So we have done some work trying to use satellite data to consume the boundary conditions as well. And then certainly there are source of air source, you know, how much we, we get from the fire emissions, right? And then also the uh, meteorologic process and the chemical processes. So those are very challenge, challenges that we are, we are facing. So you got smoke, for example, how will we incorporate them into them? How do we know if the fires were will continue tomorrow or not, right? Those are the challenges. If there is a rain, maybe the, the fire will diminish. But so we, those are a lot of challenges here. So my group has trying to, um, to, to kind of lay out several objectives that we have been working on. And so one is trying to use satellite characterization um, to characterize the high spatial thermal variation of air source, including their source of the precursors. And then try to develop So, to do that, we have, uh, have developed, we have uh, uh, student 
doesn't that, seem to so. be on anymore. Battery eyes yeah, in the round out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a battery. It's batteries on the. Okay, I'm okay. You know, I used to teach class in a theater, so, <laughs> so I have clickers, I have yeah. microphones for students, and I got here. So anyway, that's okay. <laughs> I can handle it. Um, so I want to start is that when do we really think about to use satellite data to look to the surface PM 2.5 or airs or uh, air quality in general. So the, the literature, the earliest lit literature I can find is actually this one by Robert Fraser and Yoram Kaufman in 1984 and also the uh, Mahane published in the atmospheric environment. At that time, they lay out the kind of the idea. You need solid data, then you need to retrieve an algorithm because solid data is basically the imagery, right? And then compare with models to get the air source information. So they lay out the the optical signals, mass transport, visibility, things like that. Okay, so they they did uh, come up with something like this for one case study in 1980. Okay, in 1980, so they are showing this column concentration of what they call the sulfur mass, and you can see those are their retrievers, their estimate. Those are their in situ measurements from the balloon. And you can see the difference there is, is a, within a factor of two in a column, you know, how much SO2 concentration are there. So it's pretty good. But at that time, those satellite data are, those satellites are gold satellites. They are designed for weather, uh, meteor uh, uh, for monitoring the weather. So they are really not designed to look to retrieve air source per se. So, you know, 10 years later, uh, you know, they have um, started to, the NASA has launched its first Terra satellites uh, in 1999. And uh, so since then, there are many more satellites that is in the, sc in, in the space to, that it has, is capable to retrieve air source. And uh, so in the Terra satellite, there are many several sensors, you know, such as MODIS, MISER, also MOPIT, that, uh, that, uh, um, that, uh, Dave, David, David Edward and others in this room have done a lot of it. So I, w w uh, in the several following slide, I'm going to talk about Morris Miser and also a little bit of OMI on our satellites. Okay, I'm going to kind of sh just try to, because I know this is like 15 years birthday for Terra. So I'm going to highlight a little bit of the slides that I usually shoot to the students. But anyway, if you haven't seen that, I will just go quickly. So it's the first time you can see the, you know, first, very kind of unprecedented, unprecedented opportunity to, to capture the fires from from Terra. You also see the very nice, beautiful two-color images that really can show the thick, you know, haze layers in the different part of the world. And not only just in developing countries, but also in in the U.S. For example, you can see the fires that when they have fires, you generate smoke, transport downwind under the westerly wind, affects the almost the whole country, okay? And you can also see this, right? Many people think that in Nebraska, there is nothing there, but in the Georgia year, you got dust, and that will be transported to all over the place. This, will the dust bowl will come back or not? If we have more and more droughts, we don't know yet, but certainly we see this in 2012. Without solid data, we probably will not be able to record this. It's a very thick dust plume over the Midwest. So, the reason I'm talking about OMI because OMI can can be used to retrieve uh, NOx. Okay, so this is the OMI in 1:30 p.m. local time, the NOx concentration. Now I'm going to show another satellite which which also retrieve NOx, but it's in the morning, a ski mark in the 10 a.m. So you can see in 10 a.m. you got more NOx because because of the uh, early morning traffic, things like that. So you see this contrast right away from space which w otherwise you wouldn't be able to see. So this allows us to study, you know, the transport, how the pan gets transported across the, acro across the globe and affects the ozone, things like that. So we also can see, retrieve the SO2 from the OMI, where you can see the location of power plants, okay? 
So there are a lot of new opportunities, new exciting things coming out from those U.S. satellites. So, and also certainly for the first time you see a climatology of the Earth's optical depths that is observation based and that is globally, right? You see over here, right? You can see that from a miser as well. So, um, so what is optical depth then? Well, optical depth basically is a is a showing the extinction of the particles on the on 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 the light, right? Based upon the based upon the Beer's law. So this is a class I'm teaching, right? The student hold a microtop, point to the sun, measure a direct beam, and that will give you optical depth because we know what how much sunlight is coming in the visible, so you can re you can measure them. So immediately you see the optical depth is really a column quantity, showing how much air source in that vertical column. But when you look at this, right, you got clouds, you got a haze, then you start to think, can we predict this? Can we use this to do the prediction? What, what the air source layer will be moved next day? Where are they going to move next day? So at that time, I was a I was a graduate student. So, but anyway, we did a study, try to correlate the air optical depth with the surface PM2.5 and come up with a kind of empirical linear correlation in 2003. That, that was in 2003. And then you can see if you overlay this AOT map with the meteorologic forecast. So you've got a high pressure right here that is collocated with this, this center of the uh, plume. Then you can predict the next day as uh, this high pressure moves to the south, then the plume will move to the south. So it's aid the um, local uh, weather, sur weather service to predict the air quality. Okay, that's the kind of idea there. So after 2003, there are, there are a lot of studies that try to come up with this linear correlation. You can see this, you know, this review paper, there are almost 70 papers try to carve a linear correlation, just try to find an A and a B. And afterwards, in 2009, and then afterwards, even up to today, uh, there are lots lots of other methods that go beyond the linear regression. Right? You've got multiple variable regression, creating neutral network. A lot of mathematical technique and statistical technique try to link the air optic depths to the surface PM2.5. Well, I was trained by training was atmosphere scientist, not a mathematician. So I think let's do something differently that from a physical point of view instead of the uh, math or statistical point of view. So what we have done is then try to look exactly how the optical depths related to the uh, surface PM2.5, which uh, to the EPS interest is a dry surface PM2.5. When they measure it, they have to heat it. So it's dry. So you need to consider the the relative humidity and also the high air or high gro gro gross scopicity, as well as this uh, vertical profile of air source. So um, Anion Cox in 2004 they did a paper on this and I find that if we just look at the linear correlation coefficient, the AOD is better correlated in the east coast but not in the uh, eastern part of the U.S., but not in the West. Anyway, those parameters are not readily, uh, readily available from satellite observations. So our idea is to try to uh, use models to provide accelerated information. And and we, we by now we have some faith in the uh, chemistry transfer models. So we can we want to leverage that together with satellite-based observations so that we can derive the surface PM2.5. So what we have done so far is then run a geoscale model, which is a global chemistry transfer model, and then try to simulate what a satellite will see in terms of the radiance, not retrieval. And then we compare with what models observe, and you will see a difference there, certainly. And we try to adjust this difference so that um, through iteration, so that eventually these two will converge. And then what we get at in the model bottom layer, that will be the surface PM2.5. So in this, in this way, we are really compare the observation, uh, the model directly with what satellite actually measure, which is the radiance. It's not a retrieval. If we use a retrieval, then the retrieval algorithm, the optical properties in the retrieval algorithm will be different from, uh, from our model. So it's more consistent. Also physically, I think it's more sound. Um, so we show a results to you here. This is a model only from GeoScam on the PM10 over, over East Asia. You see model kind of unestimated in many places. Uh, and then this one is model plus modis product. If you're just using their standard product, you see a huge overestimation because the air optic depths over here 
from what is retrieved algorithm is overestimated. So you, ca you cannot get that error away unless you use radiance data here. This is our own retrieval. So you got a model plus what is reflectance. And you can see that the boost in terms of correlation and also the bias is much better than either using model or using model plus what is standard product. So um, so then we think for a while, well, if we we know that surface PM2.5 in, uh, in the model is constrained, can we then calculate back to the emissions, right? So, you know, if you are running a chemistry transfer model, you know there are two types of emissions. One is called bottom-up, and another one is called top-down. The bottom-up basically is that you got all the data based upon the ground-based reports, right? How much uh, power plants you have, how many power plants you have, how much emissions from agriculture practice, or how much fires, uh, uh, how much acre of the land was burned. And then you estimate those emissions, right? But the problem, the disadvantage of this is that you you got two or three year lag, right? If you are going to run on air quality focus for tomorrow, you probably are using the air the emission uh, inventory two years ago, which in many developing countries, you know, you could have large errors because that there are huge development urban urbanization things like that. Also, more often those emissions are are seasonal or annual, the lack of the month-to-month -month variation, because it, the ground based of data just don't resolve that level of details. And so, but but but, but their ground based estimates, so they have they are chemically speciated, meaning that you can get SO2, you can get AO2, you can get things like that. So, um, on the other hand, is that because they are looking at the scenes that purely at the from the surface, so what is in the air? Is not is kind of uh, have is, is is not included there. So, but we know any any emissions from the surface even when you get into the into the atmosphere, unless you have 24-hour monitoring of what is coming from Earth's surface. Otherwise, you will always will have errors. So, this is kind of is in contrast with satellite observations, right? If you look at the satellite aerosol retrievers or just look to the try to retrieve aerosols. Um, those satellite observations, they have high potential for near real time. Every day you get a satellite images daily and also can be high resolution from geo platform. It's global with high spatial resolution. It measures trace gases and air optic depths. Although it's not chemically special for aerosols, but for many trace gases, we can resolve that. Also, it's a reflecting column mass, right? That's the first order of what you actually emitted. If you take the uh, deposition out and taking seeing other things like the, for the, if you know the lifetime if, you know for the most for the book part what is in the atmosphere is a more a direct reflection of the emissions than just surface measurements alone okay so these are the advantages so we try to try to use satellite observation to constrain those emissions so what we did then in collaboration in collaboration with Dave and Hensi in the in the in in the CU is try to use the choose cam adjoint model so you got source uh, you transport the chemistry and the convection, you got the receptor, right? But th this adjoint model basically calculates backwards, right? You got adjoint for convection, chemistry, and the transport, even when you get to the source. You try to optimize them. Um, using satellite observations, you, you get what you see at that point, and then you calculate backwards. So with this idea, we basically add another step here, right? Once you got this converge, you go back to look at the emissions, right? You go back to look at the emissions. So I show you some examples here. Uh, this one is for still for the for the 2008 in April 2008. So in April 2008, we are using 2006 uh, emissions, and you can see here this is called a power SOD emission. Basically, it's the 2006 emissions. This, this is look 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 like this. The posterior emissions, which is uh, from OMI, right? But by, by using the air by using more these air optic depths, uh, by using more these reflectance to constrain the emissions. And then, then we can get the emissions, and then sample it at, at the OMI uh, overpass time and the location. This is what you get, okay? And you can see these two, you can see a reduction in the SO2, okay? So this is the SO OMI actually observed, okay? So this one is from MODIS at the uh, location and the time that is sampled by OMI. This one is actually from OMI. This is one is a priori. You can see the scatter plot here. Okay, this is OMI SO2 we use as a truth. This is the primary emission you can see are overestimating. But after the posterior with the more air optic depths, you can continue this SO2 emission 
And then when you do the simulation, it it matches the OMI SO2 very well. So it's an independent check. And this is very interesting because if you because by the uh, so you can use this one month by month to look the monthly variation of the SO2 emissions. Um, you can also look the NO2. This is kind of the same layout here, and you compare the OMI NO2 with the juice cam NO2. Priority emissions using priority emissions using posterior emissions. You can see a re see posterior emissions give you better results. This is understandable because in 2008 Beijing was preparing the Olympic Games. They already take a lot of efforts to reduce the emissions. But this is a nice shoe to see that from optical depth, from satellite images, you can convert, you can constrain the uh, aerosol emissions and the precursors. And we also did some in situ measurements here. Okay, So this is the uh, default run for dust emissions. And this is the, uh, the priority. In situ is a black line, and the green is the poster. You can see after the optimization using solid measurements, the poster matches better with this in situ measurements, which is in the black line here, with also the optical depth here. So this work primarily is done by my recent PhD. Uh, he's now Dr. Xu here. So he pops in, in this paper here, OK? Um, so I'm going to also kind of switch here to talk a little bit about the fire emissions. Um, the fire emissions, I think, almost you know, now get to the spring from from spring season to summer season, up to the early fall. Probably every week, if you turn on the TV, you will see the report of fires in somewhere. Last week we already had something in California, right? So we have done some work try to develop algorithm to calculate the subpixel fires, uh, because the MODIS pixel is one kilometer, and most time the fire size is less than that. So you want to know in that one kilometer how much is the temperature of that fire and how big is the fire area. So we have developed algorithms and using the UAVs that which uh, uh, to validate them. So this, this work was done by David Peterson, who already graduated several, uh, two years ago. But anyway, so once you know this, you can generate a smoke emission inventory because you know the fire's location, size, and temperature. And then you can put into the wolf cam to study the how the biomass burning affects the regional climate and things like that. So, believe it or not, there are quite there are several uh, fire emission inventories, and they actually have very large uncertainties. I know, for example, uh, you know, Kristen, we have been collaborating even before I come here. So we hope we have more collaborations here. So we had a paper last year, tried to look at all the emission inventories from different. Uh, 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 kind of the uh, groups focus on the same month, same same year, and also same location to see how much difference are they. So you can see those are the smoke emission inventories from Flambe, Fing, Gfet, and also other groups as well. If you look at the numbers here, Flambe has a maximum um, largest emission, 1,200 gigatons for the uh, February of the, I think it's 2010. Anyway, so you can look at other cases. The smallest one is the one by, by NOAA. It's only 103. So this emission difference is a factor of 13. And we found most of these differences are actually located in the regions where you see large fires. And those are makes the difference. So this work is done by Feng Zhang uh, in showing here. So we want to better characterize, especially in those large fires, we need to provide much more information than needed to constrain this uh, emission estimate. So what we have done then is try to using the firelight seen by a new sensor called VIRS. And there are some couple there are some work already done by the NOAA's group, led by Arlovich in, in NOAA labs, look at the city lights. But we want to continue to look at the fires. Our idea is that if you in a place where there you know there are not too many people live. And if you see the light and it's hot, then likely it's to be a fire, right? That's the idea. It's very simple. In the past, uh, the algorithm has been based on IR, not based on the visible, because there is no visible data. But if you date back to look the literature, you will find the first uh, um, uh, the first detection of this fire from space is actually made very qualitatively, and is actually using visible light using the visible light that sampled by the DOD satellites. Okay. But anyway, we are kind of now back back again. You know, forty years later we're back again, combine 
infrared and visible to characterize to characterize the fire. So you can see this is the I think it's two not twelve. This is a high park fire, not probably not very far away from here. I don't know, but you can see those are the cities, right? Those are the fires. So that's why you can see that right away here. So what we have done then is try to develop algorithm to mapping the uh, the fire in terms of the front and uh, the fire pixels. So I'm showing here is a is for the remove fire in the 2012. Uh, this one here is showing the different days. You probably cannot see it. You know, the burn area by fires in different days. This this figure is provided by U.S. Uh, Forest Service. So during the night time, they actually fly a, a aircraft and map them. This one is a standard VR's fire product, and you can see there are a lot of uh, kind of the empty space here that you don't see it very well. This one is by adding the visible light at night. You can see this one much nicely compared to this one. These, these spots here are different. You know, you see the, how the fire front is moving. So if you color them into different, different days, you can see how they progress and they expand. So this image is much fewer than this image here. So I think we can see, we can better characterize the fires by using the visible light at night. More than that, we actually can also see fires through clouds. If a cloud in the night time is not very thick, you can see clouds. And then you can see the fires underneath the clouds. This is something really cool, I think. Because in the past, if you're just using IR channel, this will not show up. Because the cloud will block that thermal radiation from the fire. So you see it's just cold cloud. But now it's invisible. You can this light can pass through the clouds. So with this algorithm that uh, my student Tom's Polyvaca is designing, you can see at least we pick some fire pixels underneath the cloud. But when we meet, we missed this one. So that's still an active area for research. But anyway, I think this will allow us to to, to do to do some things that uh, you know uh, to est better estimate the fire emissions. So uh, then once we have fire emissions, we can also study the how the you know, smoke air source affects affects the clouds, uh, semi-direct effect. So I'm, I'm not going to go level of details. Just want to say if the air source effect on cloud, even even not through the indirect effect, uh, indirect, but but through the semi-direct effect, it just depends on how the cloud layer and air source layer are relatively positioned, right? So we conduct a study over the Southeast Asia. Uh, when you got a lot of fires, and you also see smoke plumes right above clouds, so you got more dimming effect, uh, double dimming effect. Uh, if the air source, uh, uh, air source layer, uh, uh, this smoke layer is above cloud, so first we need to know is that how high the injection height of the smoke air source. So we did a study here by using Clipso data. So we first we set the injection height is a two two kilometers. And then we also set the signature height to 0 0.8 km. If we just want to have one number in the model, what what that optimal number? You can see if you set to 2 km, there is nowhere match this uh, eclipse ob observations. This is using the air source extinction profile. But if you're using 0.8 km, then you match them pretty well. So once you know that the injection height is 0.8, kind of optimal there, then you can look at the, how the uh, climatology, how they look like. So this is the vertical profile of, of air source by Clipso over the Southeast Asia. And this is the, the motor simulation with different ejection height. You can clearly see if 0.8 kilometers is much better, matches much better in the Clipso. So this kind of vertical uh, information provides a constraint for us to st study air source effects on clouds. So, so we can look at some simulations. Uh, and shown here is the Shadow air radio forcing that at the top atmosphere. You can see that it's all over the place is a warming effect uh, because the air source are above a cloud. You can slowly see if we sort this forcing for cases for clear sky only, cloud fraction less than 5%, then it's, it's cooling effect. Slowly, if you have mid cloud less than 0.05 and also high cloud less than 0.05, you can slowly see that this warming is probably con due to the low-level clouds. Air source is above low-level clouds. So we come up with this uh, uh, this conceptual model here that is done by Twig in the 2004 paper is that if you don't consider air source feedback, this is how it looks like, 
right? You got you got sea breeze as well because it's in the Southeast Asia. You got pretty strong sea breeze. We actually similar that very well uh, here, here, okay, in different times. So the idea, the concept model here is that if you consider the smoke relief effects, you will find that the your line of the temperature during the daytime will decrease because the smoke layer blocks solar radiation to the surface. But above cloud, you actually have a warming effect because the smoke air sort of start to uh, absorb the solar radiation much more because you got double reflection that all goes through the smoke air solar. Layer. So you got the warming, you got a little bit, of, a little bit of updraft above the clouds. So you can see that because the temperature decreases during the daytime, your sea breeze actually is 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 going to be weakening during the daytime. But during nighttime, will be the opposite because this residual effect during the daytime will make the cooler cooler temperature during the night over the land. So so you can see this kind of in a very local scale how the air sort of affects the affects the um, affects the meteorology there. So I'm looking into uh, talk about some, some outlook studies. So why is that uh, the temple that I think uh, um, you know uh, David and, and we are all involved in this one? Uh, this can be uh, is led by the uh, Kelly Chance from the uh, um, from the SAO and it's a UVI mission. Uh, they are going to measure the um, uh, pollutants at two kilometer times four by four by five kilometers. So it's going to be in a much finer resolution for ozone, primarily for trace gases, and to some to some extent for aerosols. So there will be sample there. Just give you an idea, right? This is this is a GOM footprint, and this is a thermal footprint. This is OMI footprint. So it's going to be can be able to for us to resolve any um, a lot of uh, local pollutants. And if we couple that with the adjoining model, I think we can resolve a lot of the uh, uh, resolve the emissions in very fine scale, giving us giving the sufficient computing power there. So the the currently I think there are uh, the the temple the sensor the prototype is the Geotasa which is built by Ball I think uh, Tim uh, is there. So anyway, so we have been trying to develop algorithm to using high spectral data collected by Geotasa to retrieve aerosols instead of using different channels. So we have uh, done several uh, several segments. Those are the data collected by Geotasa from 400, 400 to 700 nanometer. And uh, so what we have done is a algorithm here that try to call a high spectral retrieval algorithm. So this is the uh, this is the measurements by the Geotasa, and this is our kind of the uh, this is our kind of the uh, uh, the uh, the spectral fitting. So we have done a lot of work in, uh, for details. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not going to go into the details, but I'm going to show some results here. Is that we can not only retrieve air optic depths and compare with AirNet here looks pretty good, but also we can retrieve real part refrain index. So this line here is our retriever. These lines here are from AirNet, kind of as a ground truth there. So we are we are doing well there in terms of the real part. We also retrieve the mirroring part of the refrain index, but we have some off here. But in the short wave, we are uh, in the 400 nanometer to 500 nanometer, we are, we are okay there. We also be able to retrieve this particle size vision. Uh, you know, this this uh, uh, those dot lines here, those red lines here are from AirNet retrievers, and then you also have some in situ measurements from Discover AQ, which is dry air source. So that's why you see they have a shift there. But overall, we are matched pretty well. So I think if Tempo is launched with high spectral resolution. We might be able to characterize air absorption um, uh, in a more accurate way uh, using high spectral information. In the end, I'm going to also kind of kind of spare ahead talk about this one. Deep Space Climate Observatory, which was launched, uh, uh, was launched in the, this year, and they are going to park in the Air One Point, which is basically uh, called the Point. At this point, the force from the sun and the force from the earth is balanced. So in other words, whenever sunlight is coming to the earth, you got the picture, right? But it's a moving target, okay? So everywhere you are going to get, get up eight hours or uh, 10 hours by uh, injury. And they have oxygen air band um, there that may be able to shoot every so far that they have. So with that, I think, uh, I think this is a very exciting field. And I'm 
office. I'm not sure if this microphone works anymore. Yeah, and maybe, maybe you're talking here. Okay, I talk here. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any uh, questions? For Do any questions for Jude? Hello? Yeah, Chris. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious to, to learn more about the beers product that you're working with. Are you working with Chris Elvidge down the street to, to use the night fire product? No, we, 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 we are, we are, uh, we have not, we are not, uh, we are have a, we have a different algorithm for it. So I think it, uh, uh, we are primarily focused on the fire detection. Yeah. I think the air product is more on in the fitting and things like that. But, but uh, and we are focused also on the fires underneath the clouds. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that that one can actually also seen by Chris Harvey's product too. Uh, we ha we actually evaluate. I have a master student evaluating his product. So yeah, I, we see a, we see gas flaring as well. Hmm. Uh, we are working on it. We we are not sure if we are going to get it or not. But uh, the uh, we. Compare the retrievers with this Google Earth images, and in terms of the parameter, uh, the, the radius of those gas flares, and we can see they they match pretty good. So I think there are hope. <laughs> Have you um uh, so for the uh, inversion part of the geoscam and the models, um have you uh, how you consider the error of from the observation from both the model? So I think the uh, error how to wait in the inversion part, and uh, uh, the second question might be stupid. Um, I'm wondering for the file detection by VIRS, um as <laughs> I think the question is, is stupid. Uh, <laughs> I, I know that I, there's a file count I'm, from yeah. MODIS. So is, is there any difference or is there any advantage for, by your um, by your method? Because I think the file count uh, do provide some information of how the uh, well is the small file and uh, so what's the different part from your from okay. your study and uh, for the third question is that um, you you mentioned a case study of the uh, sea breeze and the meteorology feedback during the file event yeah. and uh, you also illustrate the uh, uh, the changes after considering the feedback I'm just uh, um, a little curious about uh, how about case if in the inland region without the sea breeze because uh, we did a study also for file cases but in US and we don't see uh, much difference between the daytime and nighttime so okay. so yeah I so want to yeah. Well, you have three questions, but but I think the. Uh, Thank you. I think so, and and I I think you should always ask questions if you if you don't know. There, I I don't feel that that if you don't know, you just ask. You know, why you think so much about if question is smart or or stupid? You know, and then we we all we just want to get together to understand the things. So. So uh, okay, so let's go to this one here. I have some. So for the, for the errors, we have we actually using this. Uh, this actually the this uh, one is actually the try to minimize this cost function here, and uh, so this uh, this errors there are two errors here. Uh, one is the observation error, and one is the uh, 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 one is the this priority error here. So we we consider the model error here also the also the uh, observation error here is that uh, we are using because we are using the modis radiance data 
Those are well calibrated, so the errors are actually very small. Uh, the model error, I think we have uh, searched literature, based upon literature, say, where well, the, the error sim concentration similar by the juice cam, let's say, is a factor of what. So uh, details are in the paper. I, I don't remember exactly the numbers. And then we also have a priority error here that uh, I think uh, we also, uh, based on the literature, situation. I don't remember exact number, but you can uh, uh, go online to find the paper there. The second question is about the VIRS, uh, the, the mod is a fire product. Actually, the, the, uh, this one kind of illustrates that. So this is the standard product. If you, this is from VIRS, but VIRS per, uh, algorithm essentially inherits from the modis fire product. And you can see this is what you are being getting, OK? So there are a lot of places where you're actually missing the fire. And if you see us here, right, we're using visible light to cut. You can see uh, most of the missing fires is, is likely to be uh, picked up. You can see more nice patterns as the day progress. You can see the fire front and move around. You can have a better picture that are consistent with this one. So I think there are a lot of potential sure to calculate the fire and to look at the emissions. So fire count does help, but, but we always want to push the limit to, to get more information for fire. Uh, in addition, we, as I said, we also can get the, some information of the fire underneath the cloud. And so this, uh, this is the algorithm is now automated. So we can pick some, but not all. Like this one, you can see there are some information here, but we're in our algorithm fair. But at least in this case, for this one, we picked up. So, um, so we have some advantages there. The third question is, <laughs> is the well, sea breeze effect, right? Where I think it really matters is about the, the scale. The, the one that we picked up is actually in the, in the Java and, and in, in, in the Bono area. So this area we call it the marine time continents, where this, those, those continents are really relatively small. It's not like the whole US continents, per se. So day and night, they, the, the ocean and the land, that interaction leads to the very strong sea and land breeze. That's why, so during the daytime, um, you know, the, the land surface is much warmer. Than the, so you got, you got the sea breeze come in, the smoke is where we just, uh, you know, uh, you were, you know, you were coming into the inland. And then in, during that time, you got the, uh, um, the reverse wind direction, the, the smoke were pushed push to the ocean. So you have this back and forth during the day and during the night. So that kind of makes the lifetime of some aerosols much longer there. But over the continental US, it's, it's hard to, on the one hand, we don't have that much of the absorbing air source along the, along the uh, US coast. On the other hand, this, you know, we have huge inland. It's not like marine time continents where they're surrounded, surrounded by, the, uh, by the ocean, where you see more stronger uh, land, sea breeze, land sea breeze, sorry. Uh, you know, like 6 o'clock, 10, 14, you see this very strong land breeze over the whole continent, but we don't see that. Uh, in the U.S. continents, I think. That probably explains a little bit. If you look at the smaller uh, let's say island, then you will see that effect a lot. Okay. That's a good question. Yeah, we use both IR and a visible light. What what happened in the standard uh, algorithm is that if in the in order to for the fire fire detection, the first step is that the burning temperature should be more than I think is 315 K. Uh, but in, so that's an absolute test. Any any pixels that below that will not be, be considered as a fire at all. But there are places actually the fire temperature could uh, could be below that. But it still is emitting the light, so we we combine the two. Is kind of a um, um, so when we combine the two, uh, we have a better. We can we can relax that absolute test so that we can have a more. We will not miss. We will be able to correct those product where the fire are missing. Yeah. Okay.